sorry, Aaron Berkowitz back with the Jewish Literary Journal with Peter Orner, who is the author of two novels, three story collections, and his latest, Still No Word From You, Notes in the Margin, a hybrid of stories and meditations on where life and reading intersect. Peter holds the Professorship of English and Creative Writing at Dartmouth College. Welcome, Peter. Thanks for joining me today. Oh, great. Great to be with you, Aaron. Thanks for there. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we were able to organize this after yeah, a while. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, first question is just why this book and why now? Good question. Uh, you know, I'm always um, plugging away. And uh, uh, like I think like the previous books, um, this is number seven <laughs> or so, uh, I I don't, I had, I wasn't a plan. It just sort of, um, you know, it started to uh, accumulate. Things started to accumulate, and and you know, I like to keep keep things rolling. And um, you yeah, know, I realized, oh, okay, this could be a manuscript. And I, I, I think this one in particular, I wanted to write a book that I only I wanted to read. Probably, I want to do something just different and kind of just for myself, I guess. I guess we would uh, we would call you a, a fiction writer primarily, but this is nonfiction. Is there a reason for that shift, or it's just sort of again, just the ideas were popping in your head and you and you went with it? Yeah, I mean, it, it's sort of like I, when I wrote another nonfiction book, it, it was because I was having trouble with uh, fiction, and um, that's sort of how when 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 uh, I write nonfiction when I'm when I'm having a little trouble imagining stuff. And so and then I remember things. Uh, Philip Ross said something beautiful once. Um, he was actually talking about a novel he was writing, but he said, it was an exhortation to himself. And he said, uh, don't write, remember. And I've always sort of uh, uh, come back to that. I'm not a huge Ross fan, but I love that line. and. And so that's, I think, what I was doing here. I don't write, remember. Yeah, Philip, Philip Roth's interesting. I've I've always preferred, uh, preferred Potok to Roth. I've always thought of sort of 20th century Jewish writing in, in like Roth versus Potok style. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I've never, I, I guess that gets like gasps in the MFA programs where you're like, I'm not a big Philip Roth fan. That seems to be the the writer that everybody <laughs> gravitates toward and they like Jewish writing. Uh, right, and then, you know it's ridiculous. Um, you know, there's, there's, as you say, Potag, but there's, there's, you know, hundreds, hundreds we could look to. Um, and, you know, Malamud is my lodestar. You know, he, he just is always somebody I go back to, and um, you know, is somebody who, who never doesn't sort of help me. You know, as a reader, as much as anything. So, yeah, and and when writing these, do you do you? have them in order or because they're more like essays I would almost individual essays is it a uh, one by one and then you reorder them uh post facto or is it uh, a process much like a story you know uh, plot line sort of thing yeah it, it depends I mean I, I I spend a lot of time thinking about what comes after next but um I you know these get written sort of catch as catch can and then I sort of you know after a couple of years of sort of meet, meditating on them in some way, I then kind of lay it out on the floor and sort of think, all right, well, what come, what can, what, what mood wise can come after this? You know, collections are really, you know, different than a sustained narrative, and so um, you want to. It's a stopping and starting thing, and not everybody likes that, you know. But uh, I am gravitate towards books that I can read a piece and shut the book and think about the piece and. Um, not to be like a quote machine, which I get annoyed when people are doing, but I'll one, this would be the last quote from the interview. And that is Mavis Gallant in her collected stories said, the deal here is you read one and shut, shut the book, you know? And while I don't think that's the case with this book, I, I do feel like that would be okay. Read one and shut the book. And then I'll pick up, I'll pick up the quotations if you don't want. Um, Cause something that did strike <laughs> me here was uh, the idea of memory versus like Tony Morrison's rememory. And you were mentioning before about uh, you remember, and then it sort of inspires. So I, I was curious Absolutely. to see that, how that um, interplayed within the work as as jump off point. It's ex you know if there is a kind of a thing I was thinking about, which is usually after the fact, but in this case, I really was interested in the relationship between memory and 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 imagination and story, and I wanted to sort of track that, which is why I included 
you know, many essays about what I was reading at the time because, and I, I, I sometimes shy, you know, I think we shy away from this. Like sometimes like I'll write a, maybe a novel and it'll be inspired by someone else's work, but I'll kind of leave that out. You know, leave that, you know, leave that at the door, you know, um, and, and here I wanted to sort of discuss it directly. Like I'm reading something, it relates, it reminds me somehow of this. And I, I literally, my eyes go off the page and I start remembering something. I mean, I've always thought, you know, yeah. yeah the, uh, when I'm at music, I, I like music a lot and I, I play a couple instruments. I've always thought that the sign of a good performance is when I want to join the band, not listen to the yeah, band. Exactly. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's it. And, and you know, and, and we may not, I certainly don't, wouldn't have the skills to join, but I have that feeling. You know, I have that feeling. And that's, that's kind of what I was trying to track. You know, when you do want to join, the, when you want to join. Yeah, I look at that. I mean, something that came up is, is this idea of um, joining or not joining or sort of, um, especially when it came to family, you know, one of the, one of the lines uh, you have in the book is about disinheritance and how people sort of look as if, you know, how could that possibly be? Um, how do you, you're tracking these memories of family. Um, so how does the idea of disinheritance uh, sort of work with the idea of remembering? Because in some ways, the memories themselves are an inheritance or a, a, a guide. So how, how do you sort of balance those two things? I mean, you hit it. I mean, I, I, I think the, 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 re the reality is is that our true inheritances are the stories that we get told. You know, it's not the check that comes when the state is dissolved. You know, and um, yeah, it's weird because I feel like I have like a lot of personal stuff out there in this book, but then it's like, like it's weird. It's it feels weird to talk about. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's all there. You know, my relationship with my father was pretty complicated. It was very. It was actually also a loving relationship. And you know, the fact that he cut my brother and out of the will is sort of a complicated thing that he did. But uh, you know, I loved him, and I got a lot of stories out of him. <laughs> and so I gained a great deal from that complicated relationship at John Harris, you know, and him writing me out of a will, giving me the language, like literally the language, which is pretty standard in these types of situations when people are written out of wills. There's a thing like, it's not out of, I forget exactly what the wording in the book is, but I was using the actual document as quotation because it's a it's legalese for like I it's not for lack of love I'm doing this but I or I'm acknowledging that I'm actually doing this so any future legality is cleared up I am writing these people out of the will you know yeah and, uh, that's a gift it was a gift I was pissed off but it was a gift I've, I've I was just talking to my wife about this that there's this idea that we often have of love being tied to connection and I think that yeah. that's actually an unhealthy way of looking Like you can have a lot of love, but have no connection or feel a death of some sort, but it, that's not actually relevant to the, you know, there are plenty of people I've never met who, when they die, I feel a sort of way, but we're not connected in any way, but there is some sort of overarching uh, connection that has nothing to do with, uh, you know, back and forth or give and take. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and this is like, you know, I think a King Lear, right? I mean, the whole, point was you know is love is that's a complicated thing and 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 even when it's when it's, when it comes to people that are close to you you know and and like you say when you're talking about people you don't even know and yet you mourn them that's a that's a that's a strange thing you know it's all strange yeah uh, something along those lines was in uh chapter 13 you're talking about celine um and uh -huh. i thought that was just a beautiful sort of image of a man and then you get to this sort of secondary part of like his anti-Semitism <laughs> language, I guess. But um, I just thought that that was interesting about, you know, a commentary on sort of uh, maybe separating art from artists or how, how you sort of maybe you don't feel that, that that's possible. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, it depends. I like, you know, I think I think we're all hypocrites on this. You know what I mean? Like I'll read Celine because it's awesome. Right. But, you know, I maybe I would avoid Ezra Pound because he was so odious, but who's more odious? Newt Hansom. Like Isaac Pacheva Singer wouldn't have written things he he written but for Hampson, as far as I understand. So, you know, we don't have to love the people we're indebted to, you know. Um, yeah, that that's how I feel often about T. S. Eliot. There I mean, yeah. I spent lots of time with him, but obviously, you know, with Ezra Pound and 
all that was going on. In some ways, I think that many of the great artists at some point were anti-Semitic, which seems to be another trope through your book. There is a uh, undercurrent of anti-Semitic uh, activities that, that come up. Is that reflective of just the memory of the time that we're in or or just sort I, of... I mean, you know, kind of in the air, you know, in something, you know, I, I, I think we all, anybody, you know, who's Jewish background has, has experience with this, as do people from most backgrounds frankly right and so but I was thinking a lot about you know how it comes up in in some of the you know the literature that I love you know um and that that I return to again and again like Isaac Babel uh you know um Primo Levi obviously he's, he plays a big role in this book so you know these are things I I think a lot about and I was you know like you know I'm from Chicago I'm three generations in we have distant relatives who were killed in the Holocaust, but nobody we are directly known to and were known, you know, the, it's distant. And yet, you know, my father was chased around in, in on the north side of Chicago by, by some Irish kids who wanted to beat him up because he was Jewish. And my dad used to tell the story as if it was kind of funny, you know, but of course it hadn't been that funny at the time, although he kind of insisted that it sort of it was almost like this rite of passage and it wasn't a big deal, but why would he be telling me it if it was, wasn't such a big deal? So I think it's something, um, you know, that's certainly been on my mind uh, as of late, for sure. You know, I love this book in the context of the, the Tree of Life and, and other incidents. So um, I'm on the temple board of my, my temple. And, and one of the things we talk a lot about in our board meetings is security. You know, I, I didn't sign up for that. Like, what do I know about security, right? And I live in a tiny little town in uh, in Vermont. And 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 yet, you know, the reality is there. And so, and I got two kids in the Hebrew school. So unfortunately, yeah. it's the reality. But it does again, not, we're not alone in this, right? Yeah, it does seem interesting that we perhaps seem to react differently now um, versus, you know, your father's reaction was for his humor. And that's right. the more t uh, traditional Jewish sort yeah. of reaction to these things is, is humor, you know, to try and find the humor in it. And yet now we seem to not do that as much. I don't know. It's true. Yeah. Like Hogan's Heroes or whatever. Right. And, and I think it's generational. I mean, I think there was a distancing in certainly in my father's generation from Jew Jewishness that my grandfather who fought in, in World War II didn't, he had a closer relationship. I think it's kind of cyclical. You know, and I think maybe we take it a little more seriously now. I, I certainly do than when I was a kid. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think maybe, and, and also, I think because of how much horror there is, it kind of loses its, uh, not that it was funny then, but you can kind of understand why people who were intensely assimilating would not want to dwell on this. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's an that's a interesting I never thought of it in that. <laughs> I mean, my father was, he, he, you know, he, he was actively trying and he, he wasn't, he didn't distance himself from being Jewish, but he was trying to join a, a reality that, you know, that was a, a Gentile world of law in Chicago in the 1950s, you know, where my dad was still, he, when he went to law school, he, there, were, there was a quota system and maybe not a written one, but certainly unwritten for Jews. So, yeah. It's an interesting theory to think around to belong is to remove parts in the context of a, a, a book like this, where it's the idea of, you know, how, how to put back the parts almost, a, a re-institution uh, of what might have been removed. Yeah, like a re 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 reclamation, you know, and, and a, a kind of um, association that I think a lot of us have with, with these, at least, you know, with some of these writers that came before. You know, Isaac Babel, I think a lot about, you know, he died when he was 41 or something. Um, he was killed. You know, I, I look at his picture and I think like, you know, he could be a relative, you know, and, and I don't know, it brings me closer when I'm, when I'm reading him to, to, to a generation that I'm away from, but I want, I want it back. Yeah. Another, another thing <laughs> that is present and I, I don't want to ruin the end so we can we don't have to, you know, you can always say this is going to ruin the answer. Sure. Yeah, no, no. Is this idea of, of <laughs> what is lost or the silence that sort of persists, regardless of how much reclamation um, is, is attempted and almost how memory is sparked, um, maybe even more so by negative 
experience than, rather than positive? I, I mean, I think that's true in my case. I mean, I, I there's a, a great deal that is conjured in all kinds of ways, but um, sorry about the rapping noise. But I, if I engage, it'll make it worse. Um, and I'm tied here because my computer is dying. So I'm, I'm trying to keep it yeah. going with a, with a frayed cord. <laughs> like I'm a lot going on behind the scenes. <laughs> but I think, you know, some of the harsher stuff that happens towards the end of this book, you know, which is, which is kind of like, I don't want to say triggered, but it's the word that's coming to mind by a reading of Primo Levi uh, that I kept returning to. You know, Levi, uh, he's in, he's in, line at Auschwitz and they're looking over the people in this line whether or not they're going to die whether they're not going to whether they're going to work and 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 he describes deciding whether or not he's going to um pray to God or not but at that point he doesn't believe I'm not sure Levy was ever a believer um in his life uh certainly Jewish but not a believer um Anyway, I thought a lot about like what I would do in that situation. You know, I kind of, you know, because God knows it could have been, right? <laughs> but for being born a certain time, we all could have, you know, a lot of us could have been there. So that triggered a kind of a, 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 a examination in his case of what he was like before that as just an ordinary guy trying to make his way and falling in love. And that's kind of where I was sort of, um, I was trying to like reverse him and sort of see him younger and not see him defined by Auschwitz. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the idea of survivor, uh, especially within that context, is a very complicated word um, because it does often, you know, we, we allow ourselves or we define others or others define us with a title, uh, you know, whatever that might be. And then, and that might encapsulate, you know, I think it's back to, to quote again, sorry, but like, you know, Plato's ideals, right? That there are these words that we put up in the sky and then, but of course, obviously, everybody's definition is something different around that huge concept. Um, but we we label people that way, and, and then that yeah, creates right. much problem. I mean, and I kind of I kind of see where you're going, like you, the word survivor, as if that defines somebody. You know, like oh, they're a survivor. Oh, you know, certainly Levy was a survivor, but he was lots of other things, as we all are. And so, you know, I I think it's really interesting to think about those, those kind of definitions and how. If you look closely or look differently, um, people are not defined by that one thing. That's what I was yeah. trying to do. I think, I think, yeah, I think that that's, you have to build the new structure around the word, right? We always think of like a schema, especially when I'm teaching students, uh, you know, you create a vocab word and then you, you build these lines around it, how to build, you know, and that's the same thing with memory, the, the nodal connections between um, different things that the brain is con creating in, in strange ways. Um, you were mentioning before, like, as the nonfiction is sort of a, an amelioration of lack of fiction, let's call it. Um, do you do you find that, that this would lead to a novel? Is it leading to a novel? Is it does it spark that or or do we not even do we not even worry about that when we're sort of creating this work? Yeah, I mean I didn't I I wanted to uh, have a trajectory. I wanted to tell the story of my family's life through the books I was reading through about a three-year period and that in its sense was like a you know it's a stopping and start story but I've always believed that even though I, I love novels and I try and write them uh I think the more and I think I say something to this effect in a couple of books actually I'm constantly making this argument is that the way to tell the, the more honest way to tell a story of a life a family's life my life your life is episodical. And um, I was using the work I was reading as a way of, 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 of working with that episodic nature, as opposed to pretending that the life of my family was one, had one, had one trajectory, one arc, you know, whereas it's, it, you know, and I tried this in a novel called Love and Shame and Love, where I, I sort of op it, it operates in a, in a novel episodically so it's you know it, it's all kind of of a piece and i i think <laughs> at this point if people were to go back and read stuff i think they would see i've been trying to experiment with the same way to tell stories for a while and this is just a non-fiction version of that i think yeah i've been i i finished a book recently 
Um, and in the pitch process, you sort of learn this, these terms like uh, a novel in stories is it seems to be the uh, the sort of uh, way that they're pitching it these days. Um, but I, I agree with you that I often, for me, sustaining a story over 300 pages is just a useless index. I've tried it and it's like useless to me. It's just, but having like 20 pages or, or, you know, just a really good short story, but that builds through makes so much, maybe it's my background in poetry or my like modern non-attention span thing. I don't know. <laughs> no, I think it's the format. That. I don't think it's the latter. I think it's actually harder to, I think, I think the non-attention span thing goes to 300 page books, in, arguably, right? And again, you know, a 300 page book could be absolutely masterful. Usually it is episodic in some way, right? There isn't really that thing where it's all kind of marching towards. It's, there's always a doubling back. There's a time element. So, but for me, the best novels are the ones that kind of have that intensity of a short story. And that's what I was trying to do with this book. I wanted essays to have the intensity of a short story. When I read a novel, I'm trying to have the intensity of a short story. It all comes back to what you said, that 20 pages or that 10 pages, or in my case, usually five pages of real, real intensity. And then, and then if you get it, you get it. And then if you can build on that, try it. Yeah, it's it's also why I've always been fascinated by the um the ten part miniseries. That seems to be like a sweet spot where you can really you know it's a long enough arc where you can get real story, but it's sure. short enough that you can you can intensify and focus. And what's fun about that, and also as in a novel, is you can't you don't and, and this is a bad definition of a short story, but generally speaking, the short story doesn't have room for those kind of detours that we like to have in a ten part series or a novel know etc so you know this is all of a piece but for me life is more of a series of intense short stories than than it is sort of this baggy kind of well i guess it it just depends on the day i guess yeah so I take that back no, i mean you know there's always dickens so you know you can always you can always go that route and I, you know but i mean he i mean my favorite dickens is bleak house and that bounces back and forth in, in time and in characters so um, yeah that's actually pretty episodic in a beautiful way I'm trying to think now if i had to reevaluate some of the, the books i've read that are you know like that how to like categorize them because often we do think of the linear time you know the the plot diagram as i'm teaching my student you know right. uh, but but how you would then split that through into sort of nodes almost along the plot line rather than thinking of it as one linear Right. Uh, you know, story back and forth. And, and I think it was like, if you can get a good scene, and this is, goes for fiction and nonfiction, then just worry about that. That's what I worry about. I, the other stuff, like how things are going to come together is stuff that's going to happen months and maybe years from now. If I can get the scene right, I'm okay. And that's what yeah. I'm, I'm always I guess that was always the big debate when I was in my MFA a while ago that do you have, do you outline your book? Do you know where it's going or, or do you not write? Or do you sort of you pick up the inspiration where it is and then and you write as well as you can about that thing and then all of a sudden it'll lead to whatever you need it to lead to somewhere down the line yeah and 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 you know it happens by accident or happens you know he's mentioned elliot you know objective correlative idea where it's like it seems like it was unplanned right but and yet and yet you know we also have different ways of getting there and so people who say like i would say i don't outline but you know maybe i outline in my head and maybe the people who do outline are much more spontaneous than they let on. You know, it's a it's kind of a misnomer in terms of making it. But I, I certainly play that game too. I'm like, I don't outline. I don't know what I'm doing. But you know, damn right, I know if there's a part one, part two, part three. Yeah, I guess it comes back to that labels. We want do we want to be seen as the uh, auteur? Do we want to be seen as a savant? Right? What what how do we want to <laughs> right. sort of pitch ourselves across as like, oh, you know, uh, I'm one of you, or I'm above. You know, how do how do we sort of right. see it right. that? within that uh, gamut of human. Uh, it, it reminds me a little bit, what you're describing reminds me a little bit of kind of the, you know, again, sort of reduction, reducing this completely, but as a fun literary parlor game to think about kind of Roth versus Malamud. And, you know, the allegedly Roth was kind of writing about Malamud and the ghostwriter, describing this sort of really meticulous, like every every sentence labored over. And I think he said this in, in um, print and non you know, he said he thought this, is that Malamud really kind of was, you know, belaboring in a, you know, that he didn't deny he was a beautiful writer, whereas Ross kind of had this freedom and he was just doing whatever. And I, I don't know how that relates, but I thought it, I just thought of it. I mean, I think it also comes back to like, uh, you know, sort of 
the idea around literature itself, you know, if we take sort of a Jewish lens on it, you know, the, they always say, right, every every letter in the Bible is, in the Torah is specific and intent. And so it comes back to like, do you hearken to that ideal? Do you see your, you know, your work in that sort of frame or do you, or you, are you sort of in a less Western categorization? You know, I know I'm, I'm a more jazz, I'm more jazz than I yeah, am. Right, <laughs> right. And it's funny because Malin would be both, but but he would definitely be that person that every letter, every word counted. You know, but you know, I mean, then where do you what do you do with others? What do you do with Grace Paley? You know, what do you do with Cynthia Ozick? You know, all these heroes of mine who are who are just moments of kind of melding into each other. You know, Bello being kind of my lodestar in some ways too. You know, um, anyway. Yeah, who no, could do it all? You know, he could do it all. Yeah, I think that's like, you know, you master the technique and then you, you get to riff, you know, that's yeah. sort of the, the classic uh, a way of approach, right? You have to know the rules, then you can break yeah. the rules rather than... Yeah, absolutely. That's I mean, just thinking about jazz, you know, kind of that jazz kind of movement in, in Augie March, for, for example. You know, it's just absolutely wonderful. But if you look at the scenes, they're actually really tight, you know? So it's a, it's a, it's a contradiction. It seems like a contradiction how tight those scenes are versus the kind of jaunty, um, out of the gate catapult language that he certainly starts with. Um, yeah, it's probably about the balance of like once you put the constraints around the yeah. thing, the scene itself, then you get to like whatever you want to do to tear up that scene. So Absolutely. to speak, yeah. is yeah. where you get the trick is how do you find that initially, right? How do you find that that constraint, that structure? It just is that's what always troubles me. Is it? And, you know, and once I think I find it, I lose it again. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that that's that's what that we were talking about before, where it's like I want to join the band. It's like because you get those, you understand the 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 sort of overarching. No, we're not. We're not. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. the overarching, right? You can feel the vibe, whatever that is, yeah. and then that's where you like allow yourself to be free. Totally, and it you know it it's it's just so tricky, and we know it when it works, and you know, but I I I I, is, I do think it's something I kind of. I think in this book, I was trying to look at the writers that I loved and just sort of think about, you know, for actor-wise and otherwise, how they how they did it, you know, and slow it down and look at individual lines. Um, I love doing that. And I think, I think that that is at least one way, or at least my way of finding out the clue to how what you were saying works in the writers I love, you know, Mavis, you know, Mavis Brennan, wonderful. Irish writer, the thousand, Gene Reese, a million that I say in terms. Anyway. So. Yeah. Okay. So, I, you know, uh, as we wrap up, is there somewhere people can find uh, your book or, or find you? How they? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you can you can find my book, uh, Still No Word from You, and, and hopefully uh, a bookstore near you, an you know, online bookstore, certainly. Um, and uh, and I have a website, which is I sometimes update, but haven't in a while. Uh, it's peterorner.com. And I think I'm on Twitter sometimes, Facebook. And I think I have now something on Instagram, but somebody else does it. But they, they, they're, they do a great job. I hope it's, I hope it's not embarrassing. <laughs> I just don't know how to log on to Instagram, but it's I will. Okay. I'm going to learn. Can't be that hard, right? <laughs> no, it can't be, right? Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you, Aaron. It's really been a pleasure. And, and I, you know, so much more to talk about. I think we kind of, you know, um, it's the tip of things. So. Yeah, definitely.